Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me talk to you tonight. I'm going to talk a bit about um, wildflower adventuring in New Mexico and the this book that I took a couple years to write and traveled all over the various corners of New Mexico, walking trails and identifying flowers and uh, looking at the different environments that the state has and the incredible diversity of our wildflowers in the state. Um, so I'm going to kind of go take you on a tour of the state and I know it's fall and the wildflower season is winding down, but you can think about um, next spring because the wildflower season, there'll be still wildflowers in various parts of the state throughout the winter, a few here and there. And then starting in February and March, the wildflower season picks up. So you can think about, you know, possible places you might want to go, flowers you want to see in the in the next season that's coming. And I'm going to go through the state um, in kind of a spring to fall timeline. Uh, and depending on how much time I have and how much I might um, cut some sections of the state, but I, I'm hoping that I can get through some parts. And most of this is in the book that I wrote that Sarah showed there. And there are a couple uh, sections of the state that because of time constraints or, you know, page numbers of the book that I was allowed that that didn't get a lot of coverage. And I'm going to include a couple of those in this talk tonight. So let me just start my screen share here. I'm going to share some images and some information through a PowerPoint. OK, so what this is all about is about chasing blooms, the greatest wildflower adventures in New Mexico. and. Um, Sarah asked me to speak a little bit about how I got interested in this. So this is me as a kid. I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, just in a suburb of uh, Milwaukee, and spent a lot of time outdoors with my family, camping, and I remember walking through wildflower-filled meadows and wetlands, um, chasing fireflies in the evening while playing baseball with my family. And from an early age, really started noticing and admiring the colors and the forms of the different wildflowers. And I remember in college, I went to college in Minnesota, and I was riding my bike down by the Mississippi River through this huge field of tall, they were taller than my head, wildflowers. And I got to a spot and thousands of monarch butterflies lifted off of the flowers and and I stopped my bike and they all kind of landed and some landed on my arms and a couple landed on my head and it was a very magical moment that marked me um, and I had already been studying biology and took a real interest in plants took several botany courses but I really like learning the names of plants and how to identify them and where they're where they are located and their role in the ecosystem and Several years later, as an adult, after I had moved to New Mexico and I've been here about 17 years, I found out about the Wildflower Festival in Crested Butte that some of you may know about and have attended. They do it every year in July. And um, that again got me really interested in, in wildflowering and uh, extreme botanizing, as they call it there, which is kind of fun. So I started picking up the camera and that's what really started me in, in photography about 12 years ago now. Um, was wildflowers and looking at identifying species. And I found a book there called The Wildflower Hikes of Colorado. I thought, huh, that's an interesting idea for a book. And I started to use it for my own vacation planning. Um, and then several years later, decided that I was going to do a book and sent a pitch out and got a contract. And, and, and then in 2018, began this, this adventure. So that's how all that came about. Um, and it's kind of just the tip of the iceberg for me. I love to do stories and work on endangered plants, um, endangered species, and really sort of give back some of the joy and the fun and the colorful beauty that wildflowers have given me in my life by being a voice for them in conservation. So this is the Holy Ghost skyrocket, which grows in a, maybe a half mile strip of the Holy Ghost Canyon in, in Pecos. And that's the only place it occurs in the world. It blooms in July and August. And 
its scientific name is Ipomopsis spiriti or sancti spiritus, which is a fun name. Um, but it's just one of the many beautiful, unique, endemic species of wildflower that we have to enjoy in New Mexico. And um, another reason I wanted to do this book was to really get people to open their eyes in nature when they're out hiking. Um, a lot of times, most of us, we're driving to work or we're taking a walk in the neighborhood or even if we're hiking on a long trail with friends, we're just sort of noticing uh, this green wall of plants out there. And that might be um, something that this group is a little more attuned to, the various individual plants on the trail. But for most people, it's just a big green wall and they see green plant and green plants and green plants. And they don't recognize them as individual species or uh, individual plants out there. And there's a name for that that biologists have come up with called plant blindness, not recognizing individual plants and not recognizing their importance to us and to this earth. So when we look at a place like the Pecos Baldi Trail that goes to Pecos Baldi Lake, um, there are over a hundred species alone on that trail. And some of them are rare, some are orchids, some are only found in those mountains. But once we start to notice them, we can notice how great a diversity is out there. So this would be called a centennial hike in Colorado. They name those hikes that have 100 species or more centennial hikes. Um, and it's one of my favorite. look down or take the time, you might miss all these plants that are on this trail. And another reason to look closely and look, walk slowly on the trails and get to know the plants is how important they are to us. So plants, almost all of the fabrics besides the synthetic ones are created from plants. They offer us all these fruits and foods and shelter and coffee, which is a must have for me. They offer us the air that we breathe, the oxygen that we breathe, and they are part of our medicinal healing supplies, whether that's herbal medicines or um, industrial pharmaceuticals that were originally found from compounds and plants. So they provide us a lot that we need in our lives and they are a fundamental part of our ecosystem services. So what I wanted to do in writing this book was similar to what Robert DeWitt Ivey says here. Um, I wanted us to get out of doors, to look around and to learn to see and to learn to see the real world that's out there. In New Mexico, there are really so many wonderful places to do that, whether that's the high mountains or the low deserts or the vacant lot next door. Um, but in New Mexico, we're blessed with so much variation, a lot of variation in our landscapes a great diversity of geological formations and microclimates and this makes for really diverse wildflower habitats across the state so we end up with different species in the northern part of the state versus the southern part of the state different ones in the eastern plains versus the northwestern badlands um, and the riparian areas versus the urban areas and the result is that New Mexico's flora is one of the most diverse in the country. We have over 4,000 documented plant species. A third of those are wildflowers. We're fourth in the nation with respect to plant diversity, and it makes for really great wildflower adventuring. So here's a map of the state from the book that shows where the hikes are that I've covered. And you'll notice that quite a few are in the north central northern mountains. And that is because really they are most consistent and most abundant in the tail end of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. But I've also covered the Gila, the Oregon Mountains, the Great Plains, there's a couple. And, you know, if I get the chance, possibly in future opportunities, I'll cover that blank space in the Northwest and the Southeast, because there's a lot of really cool plants in those areas as well. It's just that they don't always are, they're really dependent on precipitation and really vary from year to year, more so than the mountains. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, naming, the names that I use 
for plants, I really want to make the book and wildflower hiking accessible to the most people, which is why I choose common names. And I've noticed in traveling the state and talking to various plant enthusiasts and botanists that common names can vary even from northern New Mexico to southern New Mexico. Um, or, you know, there are different Spanish words or in indigenous words for plants versus the English words. Um, but so what I did was I included a chart in the back with all of the scientific names and their common names so that if anybody had any questions, they could look at that and know exactly the plant that we are talking about. But I am going to use common names today, like in the bottom here. This is the Pasque flower. It's one of our spring ephemeral flowers. It's one of the first that blooms in the northern mountains. And it blooms before anything else, mostly before any other vegetation comes up, before any deciduous trees put on their leaves. So it can bloom and get pollinated and put out its seed as quickly as possible in the spring. And then by, this usually blooms at the end of March, and by May they're gone and a whole other set of flowers are taking over for the summer. So we have several spring ephemerals, especially in the northern mountains and the forest. Candle anemone, uh, purple clematis, there are various ones that do this. I'm going to start with the sky islands. These are the Sky Islands of the South, the Oregon Mountains, are really for me where wildflower season begins in the spring in mass. So Sky Islands are these islands that are surrounded by desert or arid lands. They often have endemic species because they've been isolated from other ranges. And over time, the, their flowers have developed into their own species. And they're really unique and often really impressive flora. Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks is my favorite place to go in the spring. Just when there's still a brushing of snow, we get um, incredible blooms of the Mexican poppies. So this was taken on a spring equinox a couple years ago, and it is under a full moon. And the poppies close up at night and they open again in the morning. And this is a, for a while, these had been classified as a separate species from the California poppy, and now it's considered a subspecies. And the difference between the two is really slight, and it has to do with the leaves while they are seedlings. But basically, Mexican poppies you'll see grow in arid land, desert areas, and they'll cover these whole bajadas so that, that as the land is getting flat down from the mountains, they can cover that whole area. If there's a good fall and winter and spring rain, um, they will bloom in mass like this. And it's really impressive. And tucked into the poppies are other kinds of evening primroses, and a whole variety, a whole slew of, of poppies, I mean, of other wildflowers. This is the east side of the Oregon Mountains. Um, if we could see a little bit more to the right there, you would, in the distance, see White Sands National Park and White, White Sands Missile Range. And this is really the area where most of the poppies bloom in the spring. Um, in April, so the poppies really happen in starting in mid-February and going into mid to the end of March. And then in April, what follows are these incredible red claret cup cactus that dot the landscape on the western side, mostly, of the Oregon Mountains. And also these really tall sky blue scorpion weed offsetting the purple and the red. Uh, there's also these desert onion. So we have several wild onion species in New Mexico. These ones, they're all edible. Their bulbs are edible. They tend to be very strong. A lot of the Native American tribes that use them would um, fr fry them a little bit, heat them up to, to pull back on the flavor a little bit. And if you rub the leaves or the petals of the flowers between your, hand, between your fingers, it, you can really smell the onion. But these ones are noticeable from the other ones in that they have this white to pale pink flower with the purple stripe down the center of each petal. And they have clusters of flowers like this that tend to be larger than the other onion blossoms. There's also quite a few evening primrose 
species in the Oregon mountains, and these will also blanket the, all the bajadas, especially the ones on the left. That's the prairie evening primrose is white, the desert evening primrose is yellow, and as you may know, they open in as the sun is setting, and they are pollinated mostly by sphinx moths, and but also bumblebees. And a couple years ago, there was a study done by a research team in Tel Aviv, and they found that um, these evening primroses, a similar species to the yellow one on the right, can sense the vibrations of bee, bee wing flutters. And so when they feel that vibration, they will start to produce nectar. And that's a way of their, them saving their resources for when they need it most. And they know that when there's one bumblebee, there'll be more coming. And so as soon as they feel the vibration of the bumblebee wings, they start to produce nectar for their, to attract the pollinators. And so it always reminds me that even though it can be very quiet and calm in the desert, the desert is always listening and interested in what's around it. This is another flower that you'll find. It has a couple names, Oregon Mountain Larkspur or Wooten's Larkspur. Um, it does, it's different than the other Larkspurs in that it's also this pale pink color. It's got these white, bearded hairs that's where it gets the beard from in the beard tongues these are called beard tongues commonly um, i'm sorry that's penstemon this is larkspur but it also has these white hairy hairs on the upper flower there and it's this pink color so you'll see these in arid lands and grasslands mostly in deserts across the state but they're really prolific in the spring in the oregon mountains Scarlet hedge nettle is another flower that you'll find. This one is really a summer, July, August flower. You'll find it in the watery canyons of the Oregon mountains around seeps. And it has this kind of hooded lip on the top flower that covers the stamens and the anthers, and then these three lobes and kind of a mottled white look. But it's the only species in this genus that is red. The rest of them are pink and purple. And it's one of the only red flowers besides the cactus I showed you earlier in these dry areas. And they're always, they like moist and shady areas. So you'll find them along the seeps and the canyons. Oregon Mountain Evening Primrose is one of the endemics. Um, it's this tall yellow evening primrose with yellow flowers on the top. Once they're pollinated, they close up and they turn to a deep orange color. They're quite similar to Hooker's Evening Primrose, which also grows in this area. And they both grow in these, these more moist, watery canyons in the middle of the summer. And so that's another fun, interesting one to see. They get to be about two feet tall. And um, again, they're large yellow flowers that open in the evenings. So the next location we'll go to is, is kind of northeast of the Oregon Mountains on the Sacramento Mountains, another Sky Island area. And this is Monjo uh, Lookout. And there's a trailhead right next to this, which is one of my favorite hikes. It's called the Crest Hike through the Sacramento Mountains in the White Mountain Wilderness. And um, Ruidoso sits at the base of these mountains and Cloudcroft is right there, Cloudcroft. And it's a bit, really beautiful little area. A lot of people from Texas come there. It's kind of the first mountains they can come and cool off to heading west. Um, and more New Mexicans should visit and take advantage of it because it's quite a beautiful area. So this is a, the outlook from the top of the crest. You can barely see off to the left there. There's a hawk looking back at me. Um, in the top of the pine tree there. But behind me, these grasses kind of go over the whole crest. There's big mountain meadows, and then there's these mixed conifer and oak forests. So you get a good variety of uh, locations and habitats for wildflowers. Of course, the Rocky Mountain iris is another early season flower, and you'll see this in abundance in the Sacramento Mountains and other mountains in the north and the Pecos Wilderness. Um, and they, they cluster and grow through their roots and so they can cover an entire hillside with these purple-blue translucent leaves. 
and they're often found with golden banners so that perfect contrasting color of purple and yellow cover entire mountains. Um, so the Sacramento mountains are really great from beginning of June all the way into September for wildflowering. The Crest Trail is also really fun because you can drive, basically catch the trailhead already at the top of the mountains and sort of walk um, and kind of undulating trails uh, above tree line and then through the high mountain forest there. This is one of the 13 endemic species. It doesn't look a lot different from other Indian paintbrushes that you'll find in the northern mountains, like the giant red Indian paintbrush. But most of the sac most of the paintbrushes you'll see that are red in this mountains are the Sacramento paintbrush, and it's endemic just to these mountains. And you can see them dotted all over this field here. Another endemic species which is locally abundant is the New Mexico penstemon. And it is the most frequently encountered penstemon in the Sacramento mountains but it grows nowhere else in the world. It has opposite narrow leaves, as you can see in this picture, and all the blossoms are blooming on one side. It's a one-sided penstemon. And they are blue to purple to violet tones. They flower in July and August, and they're really abundant on this crest trail that I was just talking about in the White Mountain Wilderness. Here's another endemic species. This is the Sierra Blanca lupin and behind this lupin you see in the front is the Sierra Blanca Peak. This is a sacred mountain to the uh, Mescalero Apache tribe. And it's not always open to the public. It has been in the past. It wasn't when I was there. And so you can't climb the mountain, but you can climb uh, the next highest mountain there, which is called the Lookout Mountain or Lookout Peak. And it's where I'm standing, taking this picture. And it's the furthest south, um, tundra alpine tundra habitat that is above tree line in new mexico so it has all of the dwarf flowers that you'd expect in our alpine habitat so mountain death camas also grows in montane forests and it can get to be a foot a foot and a half tall but here on the top of lookout mountain above tree line it is only four inches tall as is this rusby's primrose on the left and they stay low to the ground to keep out of the cold winds and icy winds that and that tend to blow above tree line on these mountains um, and you can take the gondola from ski apache area to the top from about memorial day to labor day and uh, then you don't have to walk up the ski area to get to this area and then you can walk back down on a nice hike which is about three miles long I'd, I'd say one way so moving then to the southern great plains in eastern new mexico where the great monsoon storms happen and all of the storm chasing photographers go looking for lightning strikes in these areas um, and it's a great area with big sky and seas of grass and really great spring wildflowers on a good and a year with good rain and precipitation. So much of the Great Plains in New Mexico is private land, um, but there are a few spots where you can get a good hike in. And many of them are not unmarked trails, but there are some key areas you can walk around and explore like the Kiowa National Grass Grasslands and Mills Canyon, which is part of that. Santa Rosa Lake State Park has the great trail that's in the book and Capilene National Monument has a few trails below the volcano. So those are good places to see these Great Plains um, flowers. Really, the month of May shines in the Great Plains where you get these mixed wildflower fields with the short grass prairie. So here we have the blanket flower, the Dakota mock vervain is the purple one in the middle. And the yellow ones in the back are probably four leaf um, stemmed for four nerve daisy. And again, it's all dependent on you see the clouds above on a good rain year, but you also get various types of cactus mixed in with the grasslands that bloom in May and June. 
again, here are stem four nerve daisy and Dakota mock for vein, that classic purple yellow combo of nature, which is so beautiful. There's also some unique flowers out there that I rarely saw in other parts of New Mexico, like these Chinese lanterns um, that have this five pointed, you can see a darker purple star underneath the stamens there and the anthers. There's prairie burr, which is kind of a vine that creeps along the ground and has these peacock looking like flowers in fuchsia colors with the red vibrant on the top of the, on the flower there. Um, but a lot of these are smaller flowers and you kind of have to get down into the grass to see them and to really admire them. Lots of variety of penstemons that grow in the grasslands. Uh, and here's an, a, a mixture of cactus to penstemons to um, this paintbrush that only grows in the in grasslands and Great Plains areas. And then there are these cienegas, these wetlands that uh, I did a whole project around. The peco sunflower is this one. It's flower compared to the annual sunflower is smaller. It's more of a buttery yellow color. It looks orange here because this is um, at sunset. But these cienegas are spring fed wetlands surrounded by arid lands of grasslands or the Chihuahuan desert. And they are really unique ecosystems. And the peco sunflower, they tend to be, these ecosystems tend to be salty and or alkaline. And the peco sunflower thrives in these wetlands. And there's only seven locations in New Mexico and Western Texas that they are found in the entire world. And um, the community is really involved in caring for them. The folks that have them on their private lands and ranches are have been getting more and more involved over the years with the support of uh, our state botanist Daniela Roth and before her Bob Savinsky and it's kind of a, a poster child for wildflower conservation in in the state in terms of what is working and what's successful and you can read all about that on the website savingbeautyfilm.com and I'll share that again later if you want to know more but in the Great Plains there's also prairie dogs, big prairie dog towns that are surrounded by wildflowers. I was driving through um, northern New Mexico, sort of on the eastern portion in the Great Plains, and there must have been 50 brand new kids out there, these baby prairie dogs who were all huddled together. I stopped and they were, they were surrounded by a wire fence so I couldn't get too close, but they all stopped what they were doing and looking, they were looking at me, watching me watching them. Um, but they would run out into these globe mallow fields and grab a couple flowers and come back to their to their group or wait for their parents to come. Um, but that's one wildlife that's out among the wildflowers in the eastern plains. And then, of course, we also have lots of migratory birds that go through the Pecos River Canyon and the Canadian River Canyon in the spring and fall. About the same time that you're getting wildflowers, you get lots of migratory songbirds. So. We have the Bullock's Oriole on the left and Says Phoebe on the top. And uh, I think that's a blue grosbeak and then a killdeer at the bottom who's doing her protective, my, my wing is broken fake dance to direct me away from her nest, wherever that was. Um, so wildflowering and birding at the same time. And then of course, there's the lesser prairie chicken, which is a species of concern. It's a, probably about to be listed as federally endangered. And they do their dance by the dozens on their leks in these same um, areas in the grasslands. So there's a lot of reason to go and see the Great Plains in the spring. And I just really enjoy this quote from writer and biologist Bernard Heinrich. Sugary Canyon State Park is another location out in um, the Eastern Great Plains, and it's definitely worth a visit. They have some great hikes. There was a wildfire that went through there in 2011 or 2012, um, and it burned out most of their forest and took out most of the oak forest and ponderosa pine forest. 
but on the other hand that allowed the sunlight to reach the ground and it has these incredible wildflower blooms that have been going on for several years up there um, with good rain and so you can hike up to the top of little horse mesa and there's a ponderosa pine park meadow up there which has uh probably i counted about 35 flowers just in that different varieties of flower in that meadow um, and off in the distance you can see the volcanic cone fields um, and it's a really great park for not only wildflowers but also wildlife um, but here we have the black-eyed susan which of all, all the sort of sunflowery looking like plants varieties of plants we have in new mexico this one's really easy to tell by that black black-eyed center and the burnt orange dandelion um, looks like a common dandelion but it is this orange color and more rarely it can be pink and it has a tall hairy leafless stem the leaves are at the base of the plant um, and one thing i learned is that if you pull it off like you would a normal dandelion and rub it on your hand it doesn't leave a mark like a normal dandelion but it is found in the mountain meadows and sometimes in conifer forests montane forests monument plant uh sugar eat state park is blessed with many many monument plants it's a great place to go see them flowering in the early summer along with um rocky mountain iris or they also call it western blue flag and uh, the golden banner so these plants bloom once in their lifetime they can take up to 60 years which is almost 100 years which is why some people call it the centennial plant they can get to be 10 foot tall and they have many many of these white to green blossoms with these purple spots on them and then once they flower they die and uh, seed again for the next plants to grow but on the the lower portions of the park you, you'll see entire hillsides with monument plants not all of them are blooming at once but you can see a great number of them some other unique flowers up there are the dotted gay feathers which i've only ever seen in uh, the mountains the pajarito area in near los alamos and then these beautiful leather flowers which are pretty common Commonly, I saw them in Colorado, but this is the only place in New Mexico that I've seen them. And they have these urn shaped flowers with these white hairs on them, and they can be a dull purple to a brick red color. And the, the petals, sepals, those purple um, are sepals of the plant, and they curl up at the tip and form this like urn. And they hang off. They're actually a vine that can grow about 10 foot tall, and they really like open meadows and can also grow in the forest up there. Up in the campgrounds, there are big meadows that attract a lot of wildlife and, and hummingbirds and songbirds. Um, they have this great field that's a mix of this spotted jopai weed, which is the purple and the cut leaf coneflower. Um, and I would often see mule deer hanging out in there, munching on things. Um, there's lots of turkeys that pass through there. I came across all kinds of signs of coyote and bear. And even at one point, um, there's a bear track that I saw and a, probably a coyote track. But I also came around a corner where Lake Maloya was just coming into view. And I heard some loud chattering of the fishermen down by the, the lake. And a raven was kind of making this alarm call in the tree above me. And so I slowed down and looked at where I was, looked around the corner where I was going and this mountain lion had just crossed the trail in front of me. He had obviously gone down to the lake to get a drink of water and then was going back up and up the valley. And I just saw the end of his tail and the back of his paw going into the underbrush. So there's a lot of great potential for wildlife viewing. Um, here's one of the deer in the wildflower flower meadows. But that's a great spot to go in the southern Great Plains and getting into the, the mountains of Colorado there. It's right on the border of Colorado. And then we move northwest. Um, still looking at the early good places to go in the early season are the northwestern Badlands. And oftentimes, you know, in the early 
be spring, there still might be snow, and there's all these interesting formations. This is a spot in the Lybrook Badlands, which is one of my favorite wildflowering places to go, uh, called Hoodooville, and there's really incredible formations up there that you can walk around. There are no official trails. This is gas and oil development territory. There are lots of roads that you can drive in. Um, and if you keep going all the way to the back of them, don't ever go when it's been raining because the roads are a terrible mess and it's hard to get in and out. But if you keep going to the ends of the roads, often you'll, find, you'll come into a big canyon of badlands and there can be great wildflowering in the area. So when I was out there a couple of years ago after, um, I think this was 2019, after a really good winter, there were sago lilies just growing in these sort of desolate, rocky areas, um, showing the sort of miraculous ability of them to push up through these rocky, dry areas. And they were all over in pretty large bloom. This was in um, May. So May is a good time to go out there. There are these asters, these thrift mock golden weed that are, again, just showing the incredible places that these flowers can grow in. And the King's Lupin really likes the sandy washes. And they, when I got to this canyon in the back at the end of May, um, they were just everywhere there was a sand or a sandy dune mixed with those tall yellow mustards in the back and a variety of other flowers. Um, and I was, I was really surprised at how many flowers were growing in this area. It was really quite beautiful. There's also things like clustered broom rape, which is a parasitic plant. It's obligate with a big sagebrush. So it attaches to its roots and gets its nutrients that way. That's why it's red, pink, white color and not green. There's no chlorophyll in these plants. And then there's other things I wasn't able yet to identify this Erigeron species. Um, uh, this is a snowball sand verbena that's out there. There are some other plants out there that are rare. Um, but really the, the story of this area is all about wind and water erosion. And they're really, the soils are really delicate. Um, so if you do go out there, you just want to be careful where you're walking, try to create the least impact possible you know of course there's a lot of oil and gas development going on that are kind of really tearing up these areas um, but they are highly erodible and easily impacted um, and they look like nothing grows in them but plants really do help to keep these soils in place and so we want to keep them out there there's a lot of uh, drilling going on every time i go out there there's something some new uh, location going in um, and there's a re, several species of penstemon. There's also this interesting cactus that only grows in this area. I learned about it from Daniela Roth and from Jen, John Kennedy, who works for, I believe it's Fish and Wildlife. It might be BLM in Farmington. I'm forgetting now. But this cac cactus only grows in the Nascimento Formation, which sits atop large oil and gas deposits in the Mango Shale and that those deposits weren't accessible until they um, improved their fracking technology. And now there's a lot of development going on in the same places, but it only grows in this sort of 100 mile strip of Manco Shale in New Mexico. And these layers uh, form from marine environments of North American inland seas that covered March of New Mexico 80 to 95 million years ago. And so these oil and gas and natural gas pockets were unlocked, were locked in this ancient mud rock until recently, where fracking technology using high pressure sand, water, and chemicals are able to break apart that mud rock and access these highly coveted fossil fuels. So the San Juan Basin, which was once thought to be declining in productivity, productivity of fossil fuels, is now expected to double the density of oil wells. And I covered um, this situation a little bit for an article in New Mexico Magazine last spring. You can look that up. But the clovers is a BLM sensitive species. It's not to be confused with a federally listed endangered species. It's currently under 
uh, BLM policy that when a project is proposed where the clover cactus grows, a developer can voluntarily move the project, they can transplant plants to other suitable habitat, or they can plow them under. And based on 2019 BLM statistics, plants primarily get plowed under, followed by transplanting and followed by moving a project, which is almost never done. I'm gonna come back to that, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of something that we can do about that. Here's some more resources if you're wanting to know about endangered plants in the Badlands. And I can send this along later. So the next habitat I want to talk about is the really high summer, high mountains, where you get the greatest diversity and abundance of wildflowers in the state. It starts with Golden Banner. This is the early season, but as you go up the mountain, you know, the season is delayed. And so you, you, if you take a hike that goes from the lowlands to the alpine tundra, you will see these almost all year round at different places on the mountain. There are sort of communities of plants that are commonly found together, and this is one of them, the Western Red Columbine, and the Canadian Violets love the same habitat, so you'll often see them growing together. Um, the Western Red Columbine is the only red columbine that we have, I believe, in New Mexico. Uh, Canadian violets, we have several types of violets in New Mexico. There's the white, a white one, the Canadian violet, a yellow one, that's the Nuttall's violet, and four or five different kinds of purple violets, dog violets. In the high mountain meadows, this is a sort of drier meadow. We have different kinds of scarlet penstemon, um, mountain yarrow, uh, there's some harebells tucked in there, it looks like. There's some ragweed sagebrush, but a real incredible variety. So this hike is along Jack's Creek Trail, which um, two or three hikes in, in the book that I wrote cross this trail at some point. Um, and it's such an incredible variety of flowers along this trail. It's well worth getting up there to take. And then there are also meadows that are wet meadows pretty high up in the mountains. And these are super important ecosystems. They hold all the snow melt. Um, and ideally, in years that aren't so dry, they keep they keep that snow melt and it gets released down the mountain and through creeks and seeps and springs over time slowly. Although that is definitely changing as uh, the climate warms. But these are elephant head, and you'll often see them. They love their feet wet in these wet meadows in the high alpine area. The yellow in the background is a shrubby cinquefoil. And then you can kind of see this creamy green right at the base of the hillside there. And those are all monument plants or corn lilies um, high up there. This is the hike up to Penitente Peak here right outside of Santa Fe, which um, there are three peaks. There are Deception Peak, Lakes Peak, and Penitente Peak. And for me, Penitente Peak has these rolling grassy meadows on top with incredible wild displays right, at, right in the high summer, so around July. Way in the background there, you can see um, the mountains of the where Pecos Wilderness area, so East Pecos Baldy, and in front here is more Santa Fe Baldy. But there are endemic species up there as well. This purple one is called Celestial Bluebells. It's um, a unique species only found in the northern New Mexico mountains and uh, is endemic. And you can find it on, on this hike. It's much smaller than the Franciscan Bluebells or the Mountain Bluebells that you'll see in the montane forest that get really tall up to my height or up to my waist or higher. And it loves to grow in these sort of craggy, high alpine, windy, rocky areas on the tops of the mountains. Heart Lake was another hike that I found really impressive. Uh, the Latir in the Latir Peaks wilderness. Not a lot of people, but a lot of flowers, rare orchids, um, these Rosses gentian up there, Ross, sorry, Rosses avens. 
This is the creeks here is the confluence of the Bull Creek and the Cabresto Creek. And I found several rare orchids right around there. And then what you can see here is heartleaf bittercress, which often grows right along the sides of creeks in all the mountains of northern New Mexico. Columbine Canyon Trail, um, it follows its name really well. There are lots of blue col columbine that grow on this trail. This is just outside of Cuesta, and it has um, a rare delphinium that grows in the canyons there. And you can hike along creeks and water and beauty all the way up to uh, a large alpine meadow up there. Again, here are the various um, violets that grow in New Mexico, and almost all of them you can see on the Agua Sarca Trail, which is kind of close to Taos, up in the mountains around there. Um, and a really great time to go is in June for the Nuttall's violets. Just another quote that I enjoy from Ralph Waldo Emerson. But the fairy slippers, the Calypso bulbosa, grow, like to grow in these high mountain meadows. I often find them in mixed aspen and conifer forests. And um, there are places in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains outside of Santa Fe here where you can see a couple hundred of them in a, in a short stretch of a trail. And these really like to bloom right around the summer solstice. Um, and they are pretty magical little six inch masterpieces. They're really beautiful. You gotta get down close to see them, but they're definitely worth it. There are many parasitic plants in our mountains. Um, none of them have chlorophyll. So they have this red to orange to yellow color. Uh, they, a couple of these on the left here are coral root orchids. And the one on the top, there are striped coral root orchids and there are spotted coral root orchids. These are both spotted and they really like to grow in association with spruce trees. Um, they attach, you know, they, they are parasitic on their roots and get the nutrients they need from spruce through a network of mycelium underground that connects them to other plants in the forest. And the one on the right here is a, I think it's called a pine sap. Um, yeah, pine sap, and they also are abundant in alpine spruce forests. So the plants get really tall. This is the Dock Wheeler Trail. It's a very steep trail going into the Pecos Wilderness. It doesn't get used a lot. And the plant communities are absolutely astounding up there. These um, giant fern leaf louse warts on the right are you know up to my shoulders in some areas and what was really interesting in walking along this trail is there were the kind of oscillated between alpine grove open meadow conifer forest and they would kind of repeat like that and each alpine grove had a different dominant species so on the left there was mostly sneezeweed and cutleaf coneflower then another one had bracken fern another one had lousewort the next one had um, lark spurs, mug's hood, and uh, those giant cow parsnips that were really dominant. So it's really fun just to see the different wildflower communities that happen as you go up in altitude. And then you get to the top of mountains and you get some unique alpine tundra flowers that are growing low to the ground and they come in right after that snow melts off. These are Rocky Mountain buttercups on the Hickory to Peak Trail. <clears throat> These are Arctic gentians, and I sat up on the top of this uh, peak, that's Hickory to Peak right behind me, waiting out a hailstorm. This was the beginning of August. So these are late season flowers now that we're getting into. The Arctic gentians really bloom in the later summer. And I, I saw several sphinx moths come and pollinate these flowers as I was sitting there. So the, the alpine regions are one of the fastest changing regions um, across the globe, and especially here on the southern rocky, southern tip of the Rocky Mountains. Um, these climates are changing the most dramatically. 
these ecosystems. So a few things to know about them that will impact how we wildflower in those in these areas is they're of course some of the fastest changing due to climate change. There's this sort of rule of thumb that botanists and wildflower enthusiasts go by that um, if you go up a thousand feet in elevation, you'll see flowers that were booming below uh, two weeks to 30 days later. And so that time period is getting shorter and um, it's coming earlier because the spring is coming earlier. So there's less snow in general. There's a trend of less snow in the mountains and that snow is melting earlier and faster and that's shifting the entire community makeup of plants. Um, there have been lots of studies from the Pacific Northwest in the mountains, Mount Rainier there to Colorado with the Rocky Mountain Biological Station in Crested Butte that are showing how wildflower communities are changing. And one of the leading scientists is Heidi Stetzler who works out of um, Durango at the college there. And she's studying these changes and how pollinator, how flowers are blooming earlier because they're really responding to certain cues in their environment for their bloom time. But the pollinators that pollinate them aren't waking up at the same time because they're responding to still daylight hours mostly. That's the main driver. And so there's this mismatch between when flowers are blooming in the alpine area and when pollinators are, are waking up and, and available to pollinate them that is starting to impact wildflower communities in the alpine areas. So something to keep an eye on. And then there's um, wildlife up there like pika and marmots um, that are also really dependent on wildflowers and grasses. They collect them throughout the summer season and then they don't hibernate. They just eat off of their hay piles tucked underneath the snow and in these rocky boulders uh, in the scree fields in the high alpine. Um, so they're very dependent on these wildflower communities continuing to bloom and to continuing to produce vegetation for them to eat and to, to you know, create these hay piles that they can live off of through the, through the winter. And this is on Hickorita Peak, this little guy here. Um, and there's a team in New Mexico, Dr. Fry, who study New Mexico pica for years. And so far their population is doing well, but there's other areas, drier, arid areas where pica populations are declining. And they're starting to talk about moving populations to high alpine areas that are higher in elevation so they can survive. It's called assisted, assisted migration. Um, so Heidi Steltzer, this sort of leading scientist on, on the Rocky Mountain Alpine changes that are happening just wanted to remind us that no matter what the mountains will still be beautiful there may be changes there may be shifts in what's blooming when and and how things are coming to 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 look and what flowers there are in the mountains but there'll always be wildflowers and they'll always be beautiful in the alpine regions um, here's some tips for hiking in the alpine regions just to keep things as pristine these Flowers that grew up there are pretty delicate. They're, they're really tuned into these high alpine environments. Um, they grow low to the ground and they can be really fragile. So staying on the trails is important and taking some precautions to protect the wetland areas in, in these high alpine areas is important. Um, let's see, what time is it? I think I have time. This is the really the, the my favorite end of season place to go is the Gila Wilderness. Um, it does have blooms throughout the year. It can start as early as February, depending on the rain and snow. But the most spectacular blooms I've seen in the Gila Wilderness are in September and early October, as what we think of our fall is really their late summer because it's so warm, extra warm down there. Um, so entire valleys can be covered in in flowers this is a cow pen daisy that we also have here you see it in all all of the vacant lots this is a combination actually of cow pen daisy and bahia uh, both like really disturbed areas 
but in the Gila, they grow in these kind of pristine valleys and just take over these meadows. Uh, it's quite a beautiful sight. There's lots of annual sunflowers. There's a couple of different kinds of sunflowers, but there's lots of ponderosa pine parks and meadows that grow a variety of different flowers. Uh, the prickly poppy is like one of the poppies that really thrives in the fall. It has these delicate tissue paper thin white leaves and these sage blue, I'm sorry, white petals on their flowers with that bright yellow center and these sage blue um, leaves that are have thorns on them or have pokies on them. And then you have the Rocky Mountain Larkspur that you'll find in all the grasslands. There is an endemic species, the Southern Mountain Paintbrush that's down there, Castellasia nelsoni. And it's different from our paintbrushes here in the north. It's really only found in the southern parts of New Mexico. We have the pagoda plant, which has layers of these blossoms on a single stem and really like pristine mountain meadows. Um, the New Mexico checker mallow is, uh, it's not a rare plant necessarily, but it is a sign of a healthy mountain meadow wetland area, sort of a wet meadow area. And there are lots in the Gila, so they look really good down there. And then uh, you'll see the migrate, the monarchs, because the bloom, a good bloom with a good rainy season happens late. Um, the monarchs really like the thistles along the Gila River. And you'll see quite a few of those passing through the area in September and early October. Again, here's another cowpen daisy bloom. Um, really great wildlife to go along with your wildflowering down there. The American Dipper is the only aquatic songbird in North America and does this really cool behavior of diving underneath the water to get at plants and insects and things that it eats underneath the water. So you'll see these on a lot of the streams throughout New Mexico, but I've seen quite a few in the Gila area. Um, lots of nice, cool mountain streams for them. There are Gila trout, which is a trout species endemic to the Gila waters of the Gila wilderness. And they have been going through several years of reintroducing trout to various streams that had been um, sort of washed out after the huge wildfires of the last several years. Um, and so there are places you can go fishing for these Gila trout down there. And of course there are the Mexican gray wolves, which I've had the honor of seeing only once or twice in the wild, um, but have heard them more often. And in, in the first photo I showed you of the sunflower meadows that's just outside of uh, Snow Lake in the valley there, and um, have heard Mexican wolves in that area, which is pretty incredible combination of huge wildflower meadows and howling Mexican wolves. It's a great place to go in the fall. So the Gila is really susceptible to warming trends and mega wildfires that we've seen in the last decade. And uh, it is changing the forest makeup in the area that the, the um, high alpine conifers like spruces and firs are having a hard time coming back after wildflowers because the average temperature has gone up enough that it's not really suitable habitat for them anymore and so they are seeing more just open grasslands um, some ponderosas coming back in but the, the the forest community is changing quite a bit in the southern new mexico areas um, these are a couple wildfly, wildfire, wildflowers that love to come in. One of the first ones that come in after wildfires. Uh, so fireweed, you'll see several miles of fireweed after a um, fire. So they grow through their rhizomes, through their roots. They reproduce that way. And so they, if the ground isn't burned too deeply, they can really come back and be one of the first plants to take to sort of reseed an area. And um, also the Whipple's penstemon really love that sunshine that reaches the ground and, and tend to grow in big clusters and big fields after wildfires. 
So wildflowers are one of the most amazing gifts after a wildfire passes through an area. They really come in strong. Uh, in the book, I just wanted to say that there are flower profiles. There are, I think there are 25 of them that gives you a little more information about sort of more common or unique flowers that are found throughout the state. So the book isn't meant to be a, a wildflower identification guide necessarily, but it, it's sort of more like a interpretive walk with a guide showing you what's there, where it's located, a little bit about the flowers. Um, and if you pair it with the wildflower identification guide, you'll be in good shape to go on wildflowering adventures. Just a reminder, wildflowers, most of the time, unless they're super abundant single species, we want to love them and leave them. Um, you'll notice in, in the middle there that orange flower is a rare wood lily that somebody didn't obviously didn't know that that's a rare wildflower and they picked it. And a few steps later, they just left this wildflower bouquet on the trail. Um, and so that's one less really rare endangered species that we have out there. Uh, there are, I think, 45 now that might have changed recently. Um, and plants that are listed as endangered in the state of New Mexico. And I want to let you all know before I wrap up here about a call to action, something that you can do to help endangered plants. So Daniela Roth at the Endangered Plant Program of New Mexico, she's the one in charge of monitoring all of our endangered plants and coming up with conservation plans. She's putting, she has suggested a rule change to our law that impacts endangered plants. Um, Currently, the state law only regulates the removal of endangered plants, so you can't collect them or sell them, but it doesn't cover anybody just plowing them under or pulling them out and discarding them or taking them. Um, that's something that most of the endangered wildlife laws prohibit, but it's not prohibited for endangered plants. And so it doesn't regulate the harm, killing, or destruction of endangered plants from any other activity. So that rule she's working to change. And there are proposed amendments that are in response to what she's seen as a continued decline of New Mexico's endangered plants over recent decades. And they're really needing additional protection and conservation. And the rule change would amend the definition of take to include harming, killing, or destroying any of New Mexico's endangered plant species that are listed under our state law. And this is a really important move. It gives a lot more ability to um, conserve and protect these species. And it, it, in practice, would make our endangered plant law stronger than the federal law um, and require anybody who's working on development or oil and gas uh, drilling to, to really look at the endangered plants that might be in the area and come up with plans to um, conserve them. So there will be a public meeting about this rule change on Wednesday, November 10th at 9 a.m. It's a virtual meeting online. You can go to this website to get the full rule change document if you want to read more about it. And um, it would really help this rule change go through if you would make a comment and send in a letter and basically let them, let the EMDR know that you're in support of this rule change. So I've really come to see wildflowers and plants as my friends, as my allies, as my teachers, and um, really wanting to do what I can to help conserve them and get other people interested in seeing them for the individual living beings that they are, instead of just a mass of green out there. You can get my book if you want to. You can get it off my website, and I'm happy to sign it for you and send you a message. 
or you can get it off of any um, online bookseller. There are some local booksellers that have them. If they don't have them, I'd love for you to suggest to them that they get it and sell it in their store. That would be great. And you can contact me. Here's my email and my website if you have any questions for me. Um, but just a reminder that, like John Muir said, of all the paths you take in life, make sure a few of them are dirt. And thanks for listening. I hope that was useful for you guys and that you'll find some great adventures in the wildflower season to come. Christina, uh, thank you so much. That, uh, And I hope you saw in the chat a couple of comments, stunning photographs. Um, uh, that certainly was, um, we just benefit from your uh, study of photography. Um, so as far as questions, people, um, I don't see too many there. I hope maybe um, you'll type some in if you have them. I put one up that I was curious about just to see if, uh, Christina, if you had any favorite hikes kind of near here in the Albuquerque area that you recommended following the progression of a season, you know, so that we, we could repeat from spring to fall and see a lot of um, different flowers. So uh, that's one question. Yeah, so one of my favorite spring hikes is in the foothills of the Sandias there uh, and Budo Canyon. That has a lot of variety. And the first part of the trail is kind of this flat wash with lots of sandy soil. And so you'll get flower and cactus and some interesting spring wildflowers and you get back into the back and there's a nice seep with water and you get a whole other habitat for spring wildflowers back there. And then in the, um, of course, if you wanna do the La Luce Trail every season, you'll see the whole range of life zones of the Sandias but you can also just go to the top at the Crest House and the trails that leave from there in July is really when the wildflowers peak up there. So you'll see what the high alpine sandia flowers are like. And there are some uh, unique species up there as well. So, but they're usually pretty abundant and lovely. And even though there's a lot of people up there, it's still worth going. Any favorite hikes in the Hamas? Uh, I really love the red dot, blue dot connected trail. So it takes you a thousand feet down to the Rio Grande um, and then along the river there for about a mile. And then you go back up and out. And there is a unique orchid in the spring seeps down by the river down there and um, unique cactus along the way and really abundant. That's another good one for May and early June. And then the orchids are there in mid July. Um, and the birding is also really great if you're into birding in that area too. Oh, and Yasmin wrote, um, the south side of the 10K trail had the most abundant wildflowers that she saw almost anywhere this year. And this year was such an amazing year. Nice. And then there's a question here um, to asking you to put the name of the meeting in the chat. Yeah, I mean, but do you know what meeting she means? <laughs> I assume she's talking about this rule change for the endangered plants. So okay, yeah. Let me put the link to that. Yeah, it'd be great if you guys could check it out and comment. Um, really go a long way to, to changing our laws and conserving our endangered plants. <clears throat> if you can't make the meeting, there are other ways that you can comment and make suggestions on this. Yes, that is what she wanted, the one on the rule change. Okay. So that's good. You put that up. Thank you. And um, okay, native plant people, any other questions? I'm also, I was curious if you have any favorite hikes where you can see a lot of cacti. Um, cacti, let's see. Well, of course, if you wanna go down to the Oregon mountains in April, You'll see all kinds of claret cup and scarlet hedge cacti. Um, 
that hike I mentioned, the Santa Rosa Lake State Park has the most incredible prickly pear I've ever seen at the beginning of June, just huge plants with enormous yellow and orange blossoms. And then there's also things like Fendler's um, cactus. There's four or five varieties along that trail. And uh, that one in Los, Los Alamos area, the red dot, blue dot has really great cacti there as well. <clears throat> Good, and, um, and here's one. Um, you made a nice website, Naturalist's Guide to Santa Rosa. Do you foresee making similar guides for other towns or areas? Um, possibly. The reason I did that was to celebrate the Pecos Sunflower Festival, which happened a couple weekends ago in September. And uh, Santa Rosa doesn't yet have their ecotourism sort of infrastructure in place. And I wanted people to know where to be able to go to see the Pecos Sunflower and the birds and the other great natural areas they have. Um, and I'm just starting a project about the pinon juniper woodlands and the pinion jays and some of the plants in those areas which will probably con connect it to santa fe and albuquerque so there's possibly a naturalist guide for those areas coming too 